Hey there, YouTube. Ruckman here once again with your weekly Pioneer Deck Tech. This week, we're taking a look at the winning deck list from our monthly Pioneer webcam event. So let's dive into the deck that secured Sir Epicness their crown, Selesny Enchantress. First up are Accelerants. Herald of the Pantheon is one of the most important cards in the deck. Reducing the cost of nearly every card in the deck, meaning late game, it's a multiple mana orc in one. Almost as important, it also pads our life total with every enchantment cast. So of course, Herald is an automatic four of. Our second Accelerant is only a single copy of Starfield Mystic. Similarly statted and costed as Herald, Mystic just doesn't have the same impact as its Centaur counterpart by lacking in the, in the important life gain department. Bridging our Accelerants and card advantage are three copies of Corsair of Crufix. Corsair helps us ensure we hit our mana drops on time, gains us life, and keeps us churning through our deck. Tack all that onto a 2-4 body to keep aggressive creatures at bay, and we have a big player against the currently resurgent Lurus burn decks. For creature-based card advantage, we'll start with four copies of Eidolon of Blossoms. Like every good Enchantress, Eidolon draws us a card every time we trigger Constellation, but has the added benefit of triggering itself, meaning it's already given us some value even if it gets immediately taken off the board, which your opponents will be obliged to do, or else you'll be poised to bury them in card draw. Following Eidolon are three copies of the Punchiest Enchantress, Satessin Champion. While not having the upside of triggering itself, Champion does grow each time we trigger Constellation, which sets us up to deliver some big damage if left unanswered. Routing out our card advantage are two copies of Calyx Destiny's Hand. It's nice to finally have a home for this underappreciated Planeswalker. Plus one impulses for an enchantment, minus three turns any of our enchantments into an Oblivion Ring, and an ultimate negative seven to buy back all of our enchantments in the late game. It's card advantage, it's removal, it's a board builder late game, it plays Roman J. Israel Esquire, what more could we want? Now we've come to the main course, the enchantments. Because what's an enchantress deck without their enchantments? Similar to the creatures, we'll start with Accelerants. Four copies of Wilf Willow Haven give us a mana dork that also triggers our enchantress effects in the late game, but importantly helps us jump to four mana on turn three to ensure that we have an Eidolon of Blossoms as early as possible to get as many triggers as possible. It also has the added upside of turning into a 2-2 wolf in the late game. Then we have a singleton slot for a quirky card from Return Ravnica, Mana Bloom. This is certainly an interesting one, allowing us the chance to store up some mana for a subsequent turn, while also giving us the opportunity to set up for a recurring cantrip every turn by playing it for as little as no counters just to trigger Constellation. On Sir Epicness's recommendation though, you'll most likely be playing at X equals 1. I don't know about you, but when I think enchantments, I immediately think of Oblivion Ring effects, and wouldn't you know it, we have a few variations here. Starting off with three Baffling End to answer all of our opponent's early game threats for the remainder of the game, because even if Baffling End goes away, they'll only get back a 3-3 Dinosaur. Next, two copies of Seal Away fill a similar role, but as a trade-off for hitting any creature, the target must be tapped, though it does have the added benefit of having Flash. Lastly, we have the one-stop shop and four copies of Banishing Light allowing us to pick off any permanent we're having trouble with on the opponent's side of the board. It's important to note here that due to all these exile effects being enter the battlefield triggers, we don't actually need targets to just play them out to trigger Constellation. So while I'd probably hold on to a Banishing Light, don't be afraid to cycle away those baffling and seal aways that just are staggered in your hand. To help us weather the storm, we're playing two copies of Gideon's Intervention to lock out our opponents from playing their important spells or shut out key damage dealers from hurting us or our opponents. Then, we have three copies of Sphere of Safety to make sure our opponents have to pay the troll toll if they want to attack us. The first can potentially let an opponent attack with a big creature, but landing a second really closes out the ground game as an avenue of victory. Lastly, for our big game-ending payoff, we're playing two copies of Sigil of the Empty Throne. More often than not, if we've survived the game to land this 5-minute enchantment, then our steadily growing flight of angels can help close out the game in short order. Enchantress is very color-hungry. So we're playing 13 total duels in our 22 lands, 4 Temple Garden, 4 Temple of Plenty, 3 Branchloft Pathway, and 2 Sun Petal Grove to help us make sure we hit all those double green and double white spells. We're also playing 2 copies of Fabled Passage with 4 Force and 2 Planes because we want to make sure we have those green sources more than we have the white sources. Lastly, we're playing 1 Castle Ardenvale to make a blocker and a pinch or potentially close out the game if things have stalled out for too long. For sideboard, we're starting with two copies of Nyx Fleece Ram to help again in those aggressive matchups. Then we've got 13 other cards to help shore us up against our weakest matchups in control and combo. Four Destiny Spinner, definitely for those control matchups, making sure they can't counter any of our spells while also turning our lands into late game threats. And we've got things like Deafening Silence and Dampening Sphere to help us fight the decks that are wanting to cast multiple spells in a turn. Two copies of Rest in Peace to interrupt all those graveyard strategies. And then finally, two more copies of Gideon's Intervention to bring in for matchups where we really don't want our opponent playing certain spells. Slesley Enchantress is certainly a fun way to try and tackle the Pioneer format, but one that certainly rewards practice and repetition. So if you want to put in the time and throw your local meta a curveball, be sure to give it a shot. 
And of course, I again want to congratulate Sir Epicness on their win this weekend and thank them for giving me a wonderful primer on the deck, which I'll be linking below if you'd like a more thorough, in-depth rundown of the deck. As always, this has been Ruckman with Crew3MTG. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe for more Pioneer deck techs. If you want more weekly Pioneer content, be sure to check out Crew3, a Pioneer podcast, every Friday on your preferred podcast platform. I also stream multiple times a week over on our Twitch channel at Crew3MTG on Twitch. Of course, all of our content is made possible by our wonderful supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to have your name featured at the end of our videos with the rest of our patrons, or receive a variety of other benefits, be sure to head on over to patreon.com slash crew3mtg. I'll talk to y'all next week. Bye!